Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 650. That's 650 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and I hope this podcast is finding you well. Wherever you may be, I hope it's finding you splendid. How am I? All good, all things considered. I cannot complain. I cannot bloody complain. So, how's life been going? All good, not gonna lie. Since I got back from Berlin, it's been absolutely kind of refreshing to kind of be back to my normal scheduled programming i think i've said it many a times on here before i think i did have a dream in the past to live there i think it probably would have been best to have done it when we were obviously still in the eu obviously the uk now it's going to become completely you know complicated to make that work unless of course i was able to kind of you know do the kind of like um working somewhere remotely for like 29 days per location to kind of not go over the 31 days so you don't have to have residency and blah 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 that made it work but in terms of moving there permanently um that ship has kind of sailed but i do enjoy having the ability to kind of pop over there and go there for a weekend and kind of get booty and come back home but one thing you realize when you go over there i think now that i've kind of progressed in years and my kind of relationships with you know or my link or my association or my love for clubbing has kind of evolved over time especially me you know trying to pursue the dj thing promoting um talking about the events that i talk about here and just approaching events in a more sort of a gig type thing it's hard to do sometimes because i've said it plenty of times before going to an actual nightclub sober um is quite a hellish experience especially if you're going to just listen to somebody play music it's not the greatest i'm not going to lie but it can be done because of that i feel like when i go there it's not as like make or break or like wowie and because i've gone a lot of times anyway but i think in general techno tourism it's like such a thing i think you should really take advantage of when you're young and i think if anybody out there is really kind of struggling or is a bit scared or worried i think you shouldn't be you should try to get those worries um out of your system as soon as possible and just try it honestly try it because some of my greatest experiences have been traveling solo some of my best greatest experiences have been meeting cool interesting people from different places who we all share this common you know interest in terms of dance music and it legitimately has added a lot of benefit to my life overall like i really do think it's kind of been one of the most important things in my life overall that's kind of made me who i am apart from maybe streetwear apart from getting into art early apart from being into design and shit all those kind of things i think opened up my world view because if not i would have just been stuck in my little you know my little kind of tunnel visioned small bubble of living in ends but because i had all these little outlets i was interested in it kind of naturally and being, being a curious person and ready willing to take a risk and make me basically open up all these little different universes that i could kind of explore and obviously dance music being the best one so i think if you're a young person now and you honestly don't really know where to go and you just want to figure stuff out it doesn't even have to be about dance music just in terms of life you really should try your best to just save a couple of hundred quid a couple of hundred euros maybe every month or whatnot and just decide to go to one place where people say the dance music scene is pretty cool and usually you'll find a lot of other young people there who share similar sort of interest so you could pick anywhere between berlin you could go to amsterdam you could go to paris you can go to copenhagen you can go to all these different places where the scene is pretty established and pretty well a uh, run and there's all these cool parties and cool djs that go and play there and just experience what it's like there and just kind of bring that experience back into the other stuff that you do but going back to what i was saying i think when i go there now it's not as make or break and it's not maybe as wowy as it was before and also i start to appreciate the kind of variety that we have here in london i think i've said it many a times i think maybe in berlin they have the best infrastructure for clubbing they maybe have the best um attitude towards drugs and alcohol and just raving in general i've noticed i've you know spoken to another friend who actually mentioned that they feel as if the people in amsterdam are actually got a better handle on it like they don't get too messed up they know how to handle their drinks and their drugs and know how to rave properly it's just like a whole nother level of an amsterdam which i haven't been yet that's another place i need to go to on my list but overall i feel like what we have here in the uk we have better variety in terms of genres we can go and see and i think that just kind of freshens things up a bit and kind of gives you more options whereas i feel like in berlin it's a little bit one note right if it's not if it's not techno then it's house if it's not house and it's disco and it's, that's it really and of course they have a really big live um sort of scene going on there in terms of underground artists the hip-hop scene there is really blowing up the trap scene they're really blowing up and just other things as well they're doing outside of it but i feel like those three genres did techno be number one house maybe being second and maybe of course disco are the only things that are running that place but again you just over you feel this over arching you know feel of like dark techno bass thing running through that place so my only reflection coming back from there has been like you know as great as it is to go 
it's quite nice i think when i do go there with the idea of going to these other things so i can experience the city in another way so when i went you know previously of course i went for the main reason to go see toy tonics party and then this time if i go again i'll probably have to go see to go to a powerhouse party at, Palo, at paloma bar that i've been raving about for ages so obviously organized by finn johansson and usually he kind of the ones that i enjoy the best are the ones where he has flipping dj pete playing alongside him but sometimes he's had loads of different people he's had cindy he's had all these other people playing with him but when he goes back to back with dj pete you know, over there at Paloma Bay is legitimately one of the best experiences ever. So I can't wait to go back to there. But I think that might be a better way to kind of enjoy and kind of refresh my love of Berlin to go to different places. But hey, what do I know? Moving on from that one, we want to jump into some topics to talk about because I feel this is quite an interesting sort of like change in pace and not change in pace. There's a quite an interesting sort of development happening with festivals here in London, and this is this kind of thing happening. So this is courtesy of RA and says Fabric unveils Exodus location and adds new names. So if you're not aware, um, Fabric was teasing for a while that they're going to be launching their own festival, and it looks like you know basically everybody under the, uh, basically everybody and their mum is launching a festival, and I kind of you know because I'm a bit slow but i only realized the reason why they're doing is because it's a great way to kind of get around the draconian time constraints that we have here in london because for the most part with with some exception and i think fabric may be one of them the other one may be fold another one may be egg and maybe there's another place in south i think the victoria or something but there's not many clubs in london that are open past 4 a.m or past five or past six they all close around before that time way before that time so if you're a, an event person so if you're a person that owns a venue or if you're a booker it becomes really difficult to book people because some of the better people now playing nowadays prefer to play longer sets and also people's going out habits here in the uk they tend to go out later so you know it's hard to get people into a club before 10 30 essentially and you can you know you can better your liberty and then every half an hour that goes by or hour you're limiting the amount of time a dj can play and the people can come out and see them but then a festival especially a day festival that goes into the late nights and when it closes is the best kind of way to kind of get around it because you can start really early and then you can end kind of late but but it does allow you a broader range or a longer range of time to kind of get people slotted in. And obviously, again, um, if it's an outdoor festival too, you can kind of get around and play with some of the noise pollution complaints too you may have in clubs and whatnot, especially if it's a bit far out. Because that's what happened with Junction 2, it felt like. Because Junction 2 was like under, a, again, maybe it's a placebo, maybe it's a real thing. But I felt like the first time I went to Junction 2, one of the things that really say it off for me was the sound and the fact that it was like in the middle of a park underneath a motorway i think it kind of let them kind of be a little bit more take a bit more risk and have you know go a little bit more crazy with the meter right and let it kind of bleed into red for a bit here and there because it was not really next to any residential place especially the the festival main bit i think there was a bit that kind of faced the residential area but the main part of it felt like it was kind of a way so it kind of allowed people to sort of you know be able to kind of really crank up the volume and i flipping love that sort of stuff i absolutely loved it so Anyway, that being said, um, it says here Fabric has unveiled Exodus location and adds a new name. So let's go through this R8 article. It says London Fabric has announced a location and more names for its debut festival Exodus. New artists joining the bill for the July event include Anne's. Big up Anne's, man. This glow up has been amazing, I feel like. I was a big fan of her for a while anyway. But then I think, again, this is just me talking from my point of view. I get the feeling that that, I don't know what she did. It was like a live stream. I think it was a boy room. And I think the Blessed Madonna was also playing on the same lineup. And she definitely had the most be the best standout, I thought, set of everybody on that lineup. And I don't know what event it was. Maybe it was a boiler room thing. Maybe it was a pandemic thing. I don't know what it was. But I do remember her smashing it. And I felt like ever since that one appearance, her flipping star has just gone shh jamming into stratosphere it's been absolutely crazy to see so big up her um you got dj ram you got shy one big up shy one you got a guy called gerald um you got dj holographic who seems to be on every big uk lineup festival thing she again a, a detroit kind of like up and coming star and people kind of have a lot of time for her but i feel like i don't know what happened but whoever's her agent has done a splendid job she got used to this uk market and has been killing ever since i don't know if she lives here but it feels like every half decent festival um she seems to be somebody that people only slot in there so big up her chaos in the cbd cop i know a lot of people like chaos cbd but to be honest they're not really for me they sort of seem like a like a um what you call it like a like a happy go happy go lucky version of like tale of us right they kind of feel like a tale of us what do they feel like if, if, I, if i can make an example of it 
They kind of feel like to me, um, what do they feel like? Like a H&M version of Taylor Bus or something. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what they feel like. Or like, yeah, like a Matthew Buxton version of Taylor Bus. If Taylor Bus are like, I don't know, wearing Rick Owens, Chaos CBD, I feel like I'm wearing Matthew Buxton and Fear of God. That's what they kind of mean that to me. Anyway, it continues. Cobblestone Jazz, Dr. Banana is also playing and back to back with Anna Wall. Scheduled for July 8th and 9th, Exodus will take place in Cal- it's a Calvidian Hall. 45 minutes train from London Liverpool Street Station. The program will be spread across five woodboard woodland stages. The new additions join previously announced guests as Ricardo Villa Lobos, Josie Rebel, Big Up Josie Rebel, D Bridge, um, Amelia and his lineup again on the list. Okay, decent lineup. I love the one thing I want to quickly mention is this um phrasing of forty five minutes by train from London Liverpool City Station. That's a strong forty five minutes. Still, that's basically the same amount of time just under it takes to get from Liverpool Street Station to Stansted. Right, Stansted Airport, so on the Stansted Express. So it's still a bit of a mission to get there. And I'm imagining from the station to the place is also not going to be a five minute walk if it's going to be out there. But from what I've been able to just see as I quickly peeped on my phone, it's essentially on the way to go to like um to Chelmsford. Uh, where, where is it in? I've never been in this area, but I've been to Chelmsford before, but I've never been in this area. But it's kind of like just a little bit outside of Havering. Um, was it near actually area wise? Uh, it's near a place called Chipping Onga. So it's kind of like, this kind of feels like a little bit of the, the kind of the essex type place where people live. It's not really Essex, but the people that, you know, the East Londoners that I know who live here and want to kind of, you know, get a house with a, with a flipping Astro Turf garden and whatnot and a, and a, and a driveway they can fit two of their cars in. They usually moved in this sort of direction. But I'm assuming if it is at these places and there's loads of grass and loads of greenery here, there should be an option for them to kind of really go crazy with a flipping sound. So that may be the good option there. And there's also, if I'm just mistaken here, next to the flipping Calvidian Hall, there's a Calvidian hatch, a secret nuclear bunker that you can visit. So it's gonna, it might be quite fun. The program also spread a wood for woodlands. So the programming, the Richard Ricardo Villa as I mentioned before. Anyway, so lineup wise. Lineup wise, I'm not really mad at it. I've got to be honest. I think the Saturday is pretty decent. You got Halo, Cobbs and Jab live. You got Craig Richards playing back to back with Ricardo Lobos. I don't think you can get, you know, I don't think you could get any worse than that. I feel like Craig Richards is always a really good anecdote or really good balance to Ricardo Villa Lobos's craziness and just unpredictability and he's just freestyle nature. I feel like they kind of complement each other really well. And also, Craig Richards can also get a bit silly if he wants to be on the decks. But I always feel like Craig Richards is a really good, um, you know, um, compliment to Ricardo Villa's style, and obviously they know each other for years of fabric connection. But I always enjoy their sets together. You got a person called Francesco del del Delgada, who I'm not really too sure of. You got Peach and Sugar Free. Huh, interesting lineup, isn't it? That Saturday, interesting. Um, then in the bunker, you've got Ash Lauren. You got Kirsten CBD. You got Ke- Chloe Chalet, DJ Holographic, Shy One, D Bridge in the Reflections Room, Ek Ellie. Eli, Eli Akula and Ski Mask. That's a really odd lineup, that, isn't it, dear? In terms of everything going on, right? These are very, like, again, techno I think one of these ladies, isn't she, is it Eli Akula signed to, um, what's that label called? Oh, um, Fiac or something, right? Isn't she? I'm, I'm not too sure. But either way, it's a very interesting lineup. Of course, Ski Mask. Um, that would be someone I'd be, I'd like to see out there. And then in Sean's yard, you've got Anne's, Chloe Robinson back to back with DJ ADH. Big up Chloe Robinson. you got DJ Assault, Jersey Rebel, and Unique. Record store, you got Amelia back to back at Hutch, Bobby with a dot, you got Georgia, you got Mar- Harry, ha- Harry Mc- McKenna, Harry McKenna, Harry, Harry McKenna, back to back with Truly Madly, you got Obi and Thomas Station. Okay, and then on Sunday, you got Anna Wall, Artwork, Fatima Yamaha, Ross from Friends, Special Guest. And a bunker stage, you got Daniel Peslo, MCD. It's funny that he's had to change his name, isn't it? That was all because of the cancellation or the mini cancellation of flipping the Black Madonna, who is now the Blessed Madonna. And I think at the same time, people were complaining about Mercy Drum Ensemble's name because I'm sure Mercy Drum Ensemble refers to Detroit, Detroit being the home of black, Detroit being the home of techno, not black and techno. Did you have been the home of techno? And obviously, a lot of people that are for that sort of like push of like you know represent representation and you know acknowledging the truth and the roots of history of, of techno. Seeing somebody who's very white in MCDE have that name is kind of stuck them wrong. So he guess he changed it by force. I'm not too sure of voluntarily, but I feel like it happened at the same time as um as yeah the best Madonna got forced to change her name. Um, obviously formerly the Black Madonna. But I always wondered how come no one came after Jamaica Sook. 
<laughs> maybe that's a mad example, but Jamaica Sook, I always thought like, huh, maybe it's just her name, innit? Like, you know, white girls love to have the names Jamaica, Paris, India and shit. Um, but yeah, he continues. Another person here playing is Josh Cafe. You got Kink playing live, Seth Troxler. This is the good thing about it being a fabric event. Because they've got a relationship with all these artists, they can book a really strong lineup of festival of festival acts. Because as a first debut festival, this is pretty weighty. Yeah, this is really good. Um Seth Trucks are playing on the bunker stage, reflection, you got a DVS1 playing, Imogen, Karen, Tape Feed and Volvex. Oh, that might be one of the that might be the best stage so far I've seen on here. In terms of balance and how they complement each other. This might be the best one. Devious one, Imogen, Karen in, Tape Feed and Volvox. That might be that might be the best one. Another one you got here, Sean's Yard. This is gonna be the one full of the shufflers and people on the pingers and mad balloons, it looks like. You got Jaden Thompson, you got Silver Lining, Terry Francis, Trauma, Tiny back to back with the dude, MD. This is definitely one for the shufflers. And then Record Store, last one, you got a guy called Gerald, Dr. Banana back to back with Anna Hall, Instinct, Mantra back to back with Tasha, and Max Sinnel. So a pretty decent lineup of people playing and stuff. So yeah, I'm just interested to see how these get received because like I said, I've, these are a little bit of a cheat code to get more people to get more people to play obviously throughout a day and obviously give them longer set and also to kind of squeeze as much as you can at people that you're booking. Um, and of course for punters, it's good too because you can get all your raving out basically in a day and you don't need to kind of carry it onto the night and whatnot. That might be a good one. I just want to double check and see what the prices are like for this event. I didn't actually see, but the prices for this event well, I can see here, um, they've got Fabric First members, of course, 35. Let's just see normal tickets. So, a weekend ticket is only what 111 pounds or like 90 pounds for a ticket plus 11.30 for the booking fee. That isn't too bad to be fair. The 11.30 booking fee is wild. I wonder why they go up incrementally booking fees. Why don't you just have like a flat rate? But I guess if you can charge whatever you want to charge, you're going to charge you can charge it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Weekend ticket is £90. And then for the day tickets are 45 I'm assuming, um, on all of them. And if you get early access, entry before 1pm, which is psychotic, really. But hey, that means you're leaving your house at what, like 10am or some shit. Whoa. So um, yeah, it starts at 11, actually. It starts at 11 and it ends at 11. So that's pretty good. So this, this is longer than what it would be in London. Because I feel like London Festival will make you end at 10. So that extra hour is pretty decent. Because that means if you want to be cheeky and really go for it you could go to exodus enjoy yourself for the day come back and go raving again somewhere else you'd be absolutely steaming i'm, I'm sure british people unfortunately we just haven't got the or i know i don't have the capacity to bounce around places like that but i know some people out there do so if you can you're going to be enjoying that one for sure going forward but yeah the lineup is pretty sick really good interesting balanced lineup i feel like the program is done really well in each of the different stages and if anything it feels like a place where it's not just like the main stages that are the ones you should be going to. Like, you know, like don't get me wrong, all the all the front sizes look kind of similar anyway, but you know some festivals make it seem like this is the stage to be at. It's like, nah, there's actually some stages here that are smaller, quote unquote, but they're actually the ones I would go and check out at like this one, the reflection stage on Sunday. That is absolutely mad. And maybe even the reflection stage on flipping Saturday might be mad also. But these are actually quite mad stages, the kind of smaller ones, or even this one, the bunker on the Sunday also. Um, if I had to pick one or the other, I'd probably say I'd go to both over the weekend. I think ninety pounds you can't go wrong really. You get to see Craig Richards and Ricardo Villalobos play back to back, you know. You get to see Cob Cobblestone Jazz live. Um, you get to see Flipping um, Ski Mask perform outside and stuff. I think that'll be pretty sick. And then on a Sunday, you get to blast out with all these guys. Kink Live, Seth Choxler, Devious One Imaging, Kareen and Tepfield and Volvox. So you can't complain. Really can't complain. So big up Fabric for putting that together. It looks absolutely sick. And definitely something that I may have to keep my eye on in the up and coming days and months. Next, we want to mention and want to kind of give an update and just give a shout out to Dead and Tears. Um, I feel like it's kind of gone um, I'm not say under the radar but I don't maybe because it's a bit too expected and maybe because everyone kind of wears the the flipping jeans with the flipping reef around them all over the place right everyone kind of is a fan of those but I feel like over time Tremaine's really kind of knuckled down or refined or just kind of luxed up 
just what he does overall with the Dead and Tears, I feel like it's really, really kind of hitting its own stride and just very simply, not complicated shit, just very, very simply. And I feel like the recent stuff that he put out, these flipping patchwork flannel things, um, which are amazing. No, sorry, I think they're flannel scarves, if I'm not mistaken, which kind of basically look like a riff on what Needles were doing, but essentially done in a more, I feel like, interesting way with these like flannel scarf type of thing numbers going on. Or maybe the flip, the fraying at the ends of the patches or the flannels maybe illustrating the tears kind of motif going on there but to me they kind of look like they are um flannels that may be taken from scarves or whatnot but either way i feel like these are done really really well and the finishing is impeccable um even though i did like a little bit of the handmade diy feel of early denim tear stuff i felt like he was kind of cutting and sewing and making it at home or whatnot i do like this kind of evolution of kind of just refining everything and this latest stuff that he's done has been so good this uh what's it called uh we'll scroll up uh, this piece patchwork um collection or capsule thing that he's doing which i think is done if, as well in, in part with um flipping what's it called in part with um levi's is banging if i'm not mistaken let's play the sound here and look at the flipping label also look at that label african diaspora goods denim tears established 1619 like oh, that label is absolutely dumb and silly. Now, I'm not just sure if it's a collaboration with Levi's itself, but the collection itself is so, 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 so good. Let's quickly get it up on here so you can see. And of course, the bag also looks absolutely amazing um, that they have available. This bag is absolutely great. This kind of camp shopper. They've got this Western shirt. But my favorite is this over shirt. That kind of reminds me, you know, of classic over shirts that I've had beforehand with some um, diagonal pockets in the front and this sort of like snap closure here on the, on the front as well. But the thing that I love the best about it is the contrast stitching. Like I have a thing for black and white contrast stitching anyway. It's just one of my flipping um, guilty plays. Not guilty plays. It's, it's, one of, it's one of my Achilles heels when it comes to clothing. Like you give me something nicely made with a flipping patchwork um, on it and some contrast stitching, I'm going to be all over it. And I feel like this is done so well. The shape of it, it probably looks like it's going to be warm as hell. It looks like the kind of item that if you wear it day in, day out, it's going to wear it incredibly. The pants to match, just absolutely brilliant. Really exquisitely well done even the hat looks so so great and i'm sure the hat won't end up looking good on me when i actually finally do put it on my head but i feel like this is done really well and then on top of that it feels like once you follow the link of course to go to denim tears website it feels like maybe the success of denim tears has been you know the success and the selling out of stuff it looks like you know he's maybe funneling back all the monies that he's making off of this flipping brand and putting it into just making the experience of the e-commerce site just flow well i feel like before the e-commerce site was a bit buggy for a little bit haphazardry a little bit like html code yourself at home but now it feels like it's been spruced up and just kind of runs properly and then towards the bottom here of the website i'm looking at online it says powered by spotify and i'm not sure if this is a collab thing but having known what's happening um, obviously what, what was widely reported with Supreme moving all this kind of on e-commerce things across the Spotify and leaving Splay it wouldn't surprise me if maybe in-house Spotify have got like a little team of people who go out and reach out to brands and basically trying to get them on board and try to have them you know maybe give them a really spruced up pro account and always have people on the Shopify side of things who could be their liaison and they kind of go to person if they have any issues but essentially they can kind of build out their entire store and make sure that it's tight and it runs well so that's absolutely amazing to see that that's a thing going on with the site but if you click the shop itself I feel like the experience is really smooth and really easy to use and the shirt I just wanted just to highlight that shirt that I absolutely love because I feel like it's done really well and also I feel like you can tell the improvement of or the success overall of how the brand is being received by people because the prices feel like they're a lot more manageable or reasonable than they were in previous times I feel like before maybe because stuff was made maybe made to order slow quantities maybe it was made in local factories maybe it was made handmade at home whatever it may be they kind of had to charge a bit more to make up for the cost but now they kind of you know maybe you've spruced up the manufacturing and production they can afford to price it like you would expect a regular brand would price stuff and this I feel like is a lesson to be learned for people especially kids out there who want to support smaller brands if you're like oh man it's so expensive at the start because I remember 
even when, because I was around when Fear of God first launched, and I remember that was one of the early criticism of Fear of God is that they were expensive and out the gate. But the whole idea behind Fear of God with Jerry Lorenzo, he kind of found it. What he did was that he was trying to fill a, a gap in the market of a particular type of fit of a pant, a particular type of fit of a track pant, of a t-shirt, of a hoodie, of a particular type of shorts. And it was it was taking kind of inspiration for a lot of different brands, right? He took he liked the shorts from Rick Owens, he liked maybe the pants and the cut of the shirt or the jacket from. Um, Hedy Samain's um, Saint Laurent Paris at the time there were different bits and pieces of other brands he was taking and kind of using as inspiration to kind of funnel into his own brand but the main reason was hey I can't find these things that are perfect to my you know liking out there and of course other people also like them that's why they sell out and he's become super successful off the back of that brand but they had to start from somewhere and they had to kind of price it quite high because it was being made small quantities. It was probably being made locally. Um, and just unfortunately, you know, those kind of things are going to be quite expensive. But if you ride with them over time, the quality standards will improve and you will also most notably be able to get something that you can kind of, not say afford, but it's a little bit more reasonable in terms of a price going forward. So I think that's what they kind of saw with um, with Denim Tears. And that's what obviously you see with with them flipping them, what's called Fear of God. And I feel like this show is a good example of it with it being the piece of padded the piece piece sorry patchwork padded jacket being 285 pounds um it's something that you wouldn't have probably seen when when denim tears first launched and again the, the shirt the shirt jacket thing is just impe impeccable i love everything about it man. it's absolutely fantastic so i just wanted to give those guys a shout out and you know it's great to see them doing great things here this is made of 100 percent cotton with a quilted lining this is more than jacket it's a shirt and it fits slightly oversized so yeah big up them and clearly they've been doing great things what's the size is available yeah see selling out really well extra small more medium are already out of stock and i'm sure medium large and excel and double excel probably be out of stock very soon also but yeah big up um denim tears we can see the quality of it improving over time all the time and it's getting better and better and more refined and clearly clearly he's becoming you know basically occupying a league of his own when it comes to sort of things so i love to see it i'm not gonna lie i absolutely love to see it oh yeah and then next let's talk about these so I went to quickly mention this because I feel like I'm going a bit mad over here. I see on social media, especially on Twitter, sneaker Twitter being the prime example of it. I see loads of people going absolutely goo goo gaga over these Action Bronsons, um, New Balance 990 V6s. And to me personally, they look a bit crap. They look a bit underwhelming. If anything, I just don't understand the hype around them at all. Again, big fan of Action Bronson. Think he's an absolute sick dude. Love his shows they did on Vice. Love his journey that he's going through with weight loss. And generally, he's a pretty decent rapper in terms of an artist overall something that i can definitely put in put on in the background on a sunday and chill out and do my thing with but this in terms of a new band's collaboration i'm just not getting down with it as slightest. i don't like them whatsoever personally and i'm actually a big fan of the 990 um, v6s personally apart from other people not really liking them but i actually like the updated um shape and obviously silhouette of them overall but i just don't understand the hype of them online people getting crazy for them so it says here despite the fact that the idea has cancelled his friends and family um ultra boost collaboration actually boost is Action Bronzer, sorry, still managed to stay close to the realm of footwear collaborations by exciting by executing exciting a partnership with New Balance back in September the American rapper and foodie quietly teased his forthcoming creation by rocking his collaborative pair during an AWE wrestling match fast forward a couple of months later he's now taken to Instagram to provide us with an initial look at the pair now don't get me wrong Action Brunson wearing them himself in this amazing fit that he's got on with his crocodile flipping shirt and his Nike socks which is funny with a pair of New Balances for me being an avid and a long term and an OG sneakerhead <laughs> as the kids like to say um, you can't be wearing Nike socks with new, with new Balances. You can't be wearing Nike socks with anything that's not Nike, personally. But hey, what do I know? So him and his fit looks amazing. You know, the t-shirt, the right length just underneath the sweatshirt, the right length of shorts. And just in generally, as a bigger dude, Action Brunson's got swag for fucking days. So big up him. He makes them look great. But to me, they look pretty shocking. I'm not going to lie. They don't look that great. I'm not that interested in them in the slightest. And if anything, you know what screams to them at me? You know what I get when I see these shoes? They just feel like a New Balance ID. Do you remember early on when Nike ID came about and they had that bespoke program where you could go into the Nike store and you could add luxe materials and finishes and different eyelets and different color laces and stuff and you could really spruce your clothes, your sorry, your sneakers up in a way you went to to spruce them up and they kind of usually um offered you the air force one as the base model usually the low and you know the air force one model you'd imagine with the you know with the balance paneling in terms of it being kind of simple on the upper and stuff you'd imagine it's a pretty easy color to like 
colorway, right, to fill in. No, no, no. This is why the colorway experts do get pay, paid what they paid, and this is why collaborations go off crazy because the regular person given an unlimited amount of colors, an unlimited amount of materials to a certain extent, and a silhouette as easy as an Air Force One to color in and to fill in will fuck it up. And we saw loads of early examples of people's IDs on Nike. You're like, God damn it, man! You paid two hundred pounds to get that shipped to you. You waited eight weeks for that nonsense. That of that flipping, you know, rainbow flipping diarrhea that you flipping spread all over your flipping shoe it's absolutely crazy and to me these kind of look similar to it it kind of has a feel of a bit of a nike idea shoe now or, or in a new balance id now it would be quite interesting if this is actually the whole point if the point of this shoe was to maybe introduce a new new balance id my ids my mbs um individual custom type of program that'd be pretty cool if they use the 990 v6s as a silhouette and actually wanted to push them but i feel like this is an official collab this is like as official as a fucking stray rats collab would be this isn't like some random you know pe that they've kind of given him or whatnot this is a shoe that's going to go into retail it's going to go into stores and shit oh my god oh my god i have to stop this i gotta stop i gotta stop you know, what's, you know what's amazing I just figured out I'm not sure if this is like his pair or if this is somebody else's pair that they've kind of got on the screen I'm just watching them now I'm looking at them if you're not listening to the if you're not watching the show you're not going to know what I see here but the first thing I'm kind of seeing here this is maybe the first time ever that I've covered shoes that are due to come out and I've seen them lace correctly they're actually laced correctly now this might be because actually Bros is actually a sneakerhead and he's from that cloth but oh my god they actually lace correctly you got the bottom bar here straight. You got them going up an angle here, creating this kind of V shape, but they go over there and then they go under here on the left foot. Then if you scroll across to the right foot, the V goes over there on the left foot and the other lace comes underneath there and it follows suit all the way up to the top, even underneath the flipping um, eye stays or the lace stays, whatever they're called. Oh my God. Okay, props to Action Bronson for getting that done or whoever owns this pair for lacing them correctly. Hallelujah, man. It doesn't take much. Instead of that awful kind of factory kind of choke lace system they got going on that comes straight from the factory floor. This looks great. Okay, I take it back. The laces look great. The colorway I'm still not that fan of. Um, you've got this like really weird combination of like a somewhat, what do you call it? Like a forest, like a forest green, like a foss, like a moss type of colorway that's like in a suede. So over time, that'll end up looking kind of grayish. Like I'm not really too fond of that. Then you've got a brown bits of leather here. You've got neon green mesh. You've got um, what looks like, it's like a griddled um, plastic gray um, swoosh. The only thing I think that's a good idea that he did here is a little pop on the laces. I think these tubular purple and lilac -y type laces are a really good pop they added on. That's like someone that's got a bit of an eye that realizes, you know, how laces can kind of change the look of your shoe and just kind of give it a little bit of a sprass. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the, the Dave Smith um what you call it the stash um air force nike air max 90s actually from or maybe air max 90s are like 95 inspired from back in the day if you know you know they kind of remind me a little bit of those and you also got the green eyelets here that kind of look a little bit similar and then the midsole is the one that's a bit confusing you've got these three different hues of blue going on here you've got this kind of navy blue you've got this sort of like you know what do you call this uh uh sky blue and then you've got maybe the Sweetway Blue or the Ocean Blue, whatever it may be. And then you've got this addition here, this kind of like icy um, blue outsole that reminds me of a Reebok workout. And at the end, you've got this really big hit of a fluorescent orange. Maybe to keep you honest in terms of reminding you of your kind of working class roots on construction sites, I'm not really too sure. But either way, the color combination, especially just this bit here from the moss green to the blue, I'm not a fan of. And that bit on top, I think by themselves, this midsole is quite cool. By themselves, this mud guard that goes around it is also cool. By itself, maybe this section here is okay, but I feel like in combination, it just don't work. There's just too much going on here, which is what makes me feel like it's a Nike ID shoe. Or it's what happens when New Balance tells you, hey, here's a fucking archive. Here's a Pantone color book. Um, here's the flipping materials lab. Here's some of our designers. Do what you want. And then you kind of get a little bit over, oh, this is a bit too much. You don't know what to do, how to pick. And you end up picking just everything under the sun. Like if it's like every color you could pick apart from black is on here. You even got a different color green on the inside of the mesh. Like, God damn it, is that so many colors here? Anyway, let's go back to the article again, see if I get more information. It says, for his initiative, 
Action Bronson worked on the popular sportswear company on a wild um, New Balance and a 990 V6 makeup. The match up with this high spirited personality has taken the dad shoe and spruced it up with a multicolor orchestration. Okay, you know, them talking nonsense here. Uh, tongue swaps tongue swap out the traditional New Balance moniker for the Baklava hit that references the recently launched digital marketplace titled Baklava Flea Market and obviously blah 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 so let's see what the recent update is on these the recent update as of usual has been following our initial preview actually brought some colorway uh, Poggy has re really revealed a closer look Poggy is wearing a pair release details have been have not been disclosed aside from the previously stated um, release here so okay this is these are Poggy's pictures okay that's why maybe they're laced properly because Poggy's been around and he knows what I've gone but still I'm not that big of a fan of them I don't get the hype they look a little bit underwhelming to me look at people are just hyping them for the sake of hyping them and you know you've got like the wrong type of New Balance influencers kind of riding for them like the Matt Welties from the fucking Complex Sneaker Show who anything New Balance make he's gonna ride so it just doesn't really give me any sort of hope that these are nice in any, any way shape or form and anybody that I know that I like who I respect their taste you know aren't necessarily jacking them but I feel like there's been this concentrated effort to pretend like these are nice and these look good to me they just look like really horrible ids um that people made in maybe the early 2000s so i'm gonna pass on these personally but hey you know i'm sure no one's gonna be kept up late with my review on those ones <laughs> next we want to talk about this i think is quite interesting obviously there's been a lot of news online about kanye and adidas for some reason whatever it may be people are just now waking up to the idea that adidas have you know basically got 500 million dollars worth of yeezy stock that they don't know what to do with i think it was quite a widely reported this was happening anyway before they cancelled the deal this was one of the sticking points of one of the hurdles that had to come over they had to come out you know come over you know, or go over or whatever that, that term is um essentially deciding hey are Kanye's West anti-Semitic, you know, comments bad enough to make us be okay with writing off this exorbitant amount of money? You know, nearly blood, basically half a billion, and maybe f and maybe more because we don't align and we don't kind of endorse what he's saying. Like, should we really be doing it? Should we really be cutting ourselves to spy our face, or should we weather the storm, keep it quiet, and then sell, and then slowly but surely over time, quietly kind of remove ourselves from the deal? Because that could happen also. But I guess because of public pressure, maybe because of people actually in the company themselves i feel like this is one of the first deals that you see with a celebrity especially someone like kanye who's really big and clearly somebody who's got a lot of influence who can sell a lot of stuff and it's somebody that could bring a lot of value to most companies i think this is one of the first times where sometimes even the talent wasn't enough to put up with his behavior and i feel like he legitimately pissed off people on the inside like actual people and i think i come to think of um or i remember one particular incident well, that was really unfortunate for Kanye maybe not maybe his ass who knows but during his whole, whole war that was a time as well where he um, where he got answer yeah his bank got closed so I think his JP Morgan bank I think sorry, if I'm not mistaken or maybe Chase Bank regardless his bank that he does most of his um, banking with for years he got closed so I'm assuming all the money coming in from years he goes on there and maybe the deals whatever it may be and also one and then he started attacking the bank online and kind of ranting and raving and kind of being you know angry that his account got closed and then he started posting the the slipping um in boardroom lineup of people that work at the bank or whatnot and then i guess one of the people that works at the bank is also a really high-ranking adidas um executive i think it was some asian lady and um, so i think he singled her out also so you can only imagine you know the kind of beef he was in at the time he was really going to war with his executives so those executives just had enough and said you know what we're going to end the deal and you don't really get that usually sometimes you get a lot of kind of public pressure from brands and journalists and maybe the public pushing the brands to make a decision and then maybe you know they just get fed up of having to deal with it and they just say you know what, enough let's just end it but very rarely do you get a brand saying you know what we just don't like you as a person we're going to end it ourselves like you can go and jump off a flipping bridge we hate you and that's what happened to kanye so unfortunately for him it happened what can you do anyway so this story's been doing the rounds that i don't really know where this came from because so far no one's really no one's really confirmed it and no one's really denied it and no one's really kind of dismissed it. So this is Kurt Washington Post. It says, hey, this is a $500 billion worth of Kanye West sneakers and no good options. And then you've got this other story here from the Rob Report that says Yeezy could set fire to $500 million of unused Yeezys. But then you've also got other stories that are saying that Kanye 
could be doing a deal with Adidas. Like this could be a new deal on the horizon coming up, which is weird, right? Um, let's go here. So this is courtesy of XSL. Again, no good sources for this, but this is what people are saying. It says Kanye West and Adidas reached an agreement to sell five hundred million dollars worth of remaining Yeezy stocks. So let's go back to the Washington Post article. It says, shortly after um, an NFL star Michael Vick was indicted in July 2007 from running a dogfighting operation, Nike suspended the release of his sh sorry of his signature shoe line. Vick went on to plead guilty and have his contract suspended, but less clear is what exactly happened to all those sneakers. Nike would not say, of course they burned them, like Burberry burned all their shit, um, but industry analyst Matt Powell believes they destroyed it, um, believes it destroyed the supply of Air Zoom Vick 5s. What do they even look like, actually? I never, I never knew what they ended up looking like. Do we get an idea? What did, it, what did they miss out on? What did the Air, Air Zoom Vic 4s look like? Oof, bit tough, innit? To be fair, maybe they didn't lose out on much because these look kind of kind of horrible. Not going to lie, but big up Michael Vic regardless. Um, Adidas now has a similar dilemma with the Yeezy line. Observers say, except on a scale unseen in the fashion industry, Months after cutting ties with rapper and fashion designer Kanye West over his flagrant anti-Semitism, the German company on February 19th warned that it was looking for massive losses if it could not sell its inventory, raising questions about its options for the now-tated brand, including literally burning the shoes. The funny thing is, so many of these AIDAC executives were flexing and talking big game, like we own the IP, we can sell it without the Yeezy branding, which I thought was a bit dumb, but also could work because I think there's more fans of Yeezys who don't really give a fuck about a Kanye as a opposed to all Yeezy fans being Kanye stands, myself included. I love the guy, I love his artistry, love how his motivational speaking he is and all that malarkey, but I'm not that much of a stand that I'm not going to buy the Yeezys because Kanye got, you know, unceremoniously booted because he said he flipping loves Hitler. I'm not really that bothered about it. But at the time, a lot of the executives were flexing, acting as if like it wouldn't be that much of a big deal. Now look at them, crying everywhere. That significant shift from its outlook in November when officials said that they could recoup exactly a vast majority of losses by rebranding their distinctive shoes with retail from roughly $200 to nearly $600 and selling them at a discount. How dumb would that be? If they just would have, they could have just easily, in my opinion, they could have if they wanted to. I think this would have worked. They could have dropped the shoes every week until they ran out on this main Yeezy supply site or a site similar and just had them set out just on that basis, just every other week, drop a, drop a whole new batch of shoes. Whatever's left over, you kind of, you kind of, you know, remove them from the site, drop another batch, keep doing it every other week. And they would have easily sold out. Resellers would have copped them. Fans like myself would have copped them. It would have been an easy thing to do, get done, to be honest. You could have closed that chapter and kind of moved on. But in this regard, it's all a bit weird. Um, because how much are you going to offer Kanye in this new deal? What's his role? What are you meant to do? Is you meant to come out and say, hey, it's okay, Adi it's okay, my stands and my flipping, you know, lower fan base out here. Adidas are still cool. Buy the shoes, buy the shoes. Like, what? You're going to pay him to basically be an ambassador and an influencer and a spokesperson or like a propaganda agent or something to kind of make it seem like it's all chill when it's not. Anyway. It says here, the predicament offers a glimpse of what happens when a fashion line meets a sudden end. And experts say the decision, which Adidas has said is still months away, will especially be challenging because the company faces ethical and financial tri tripwires at every turn. Newly installed CEO Bjorn Golden signaled this month that the company might not sell any existing product, which analysts valued from $300 to $500 million. The company said it could lose much of its 1.2 million euros, um, billion euros so in revenue this year, and 500 million euros in operating profit it cannot um, repurpose the merchandise he's quote um no a quote from another analyst said what makes this so dramatic is how big it is said wedbush analyst tom nickett noting that the easy brand was do doing nearly two billion a year in revenue holy shit that's a really big substantial part right this is business and abruptness which has happened is also remarkable that's why i felt even at the time i was like I think that's why Kanye maybe had so much confidence because I think any serial biz, any real serious, hard nosed, you know, emotionless landlord s businessman would have never cut ties with Kanye. They would just they would let it ride out. Like if Balenciaga read out with flipping Demna, right, and that flipping kitty diddling BDSM thing, then they could have easily read out the anti-Semitic thing. I know at the time it was wild, but 
that's what a real businessman would do. They would have just read it out. They would have kind of put their head in the sand. They would have put out vague statement after vague statement saying loads of words, but not really saying anything. They would have said we're, we're for, for everybody, we're for love. They would have said everything. They would have, said, they would have done what, what Kim Kardashian did, where she didn't publicly come out and disavow Blen Shaga, but basically said, we're working on something and we are, you know, making sure this doesn't happen again. Basically never disavowed them, even though she they did stuff with kids, right? And she's trying to pretend to be Mother Teresa. It was like, nah, let's just keep this business. You keep that vague, you keep that tight, you keep your counsel, and then when the coast is clear, you pop back out again. That's what they probably should have done. The company ended his relationship with the entertainer who now goes by Ye in late October, following a string of controversies beginning with him appearing in a White Lives Matter t-shirt at his Paris Fashion Week show. Days later, he made the anti-Semitic comments on Instagram and Twitter, and then doubled down on the rhetoric in the podcast. He honored a personal interview with Fox News with Tucker Carlson. Seventies of political leaders and Jewish organizations condemned the artist and called out Aidas, which was a slower to act than any of his business partners, because they had much more on the line. Of course they were. Ben Shark and JP Morgan Chase, that's the bank I mentioned, and other companies to end the relationship with him weeks later and Gap announced it would no longer carry his product. Yeah, the Gap the Gap ending felt a little bit more personal. I felt like Gap was probably more personal even than Aguilas. I felt like Gap, he already was on a tightrope. I don't think they liked him overall. I think if you still has leaked um, meetings with um, executives where for every reason, Kanye doesn't like sitting down in meetings. He likes to stand up. So he's shouting at them and saying his stuff and just being angry at the drops and the lack of change in retail because I guess... Gap just didn't want to do what he wanted to do. I think they wanted to have a, you know, a celebrity collaboration because it helped them sell some more items. But I think Gap, one of those companies, there's few of them exist where they're kind of just happy doing what they're doing. Even though they probably could innovate, it probably could help them if they kind of spruce things up a bit. They're just happy kind of trudging along. And, you know, Kanye came in and tried to take a hammer to everything. And they're like, no, 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 no. Not everything around here is a nail, my friend. Relax. We're doing pretty well. We're not doing as well as maybe you'd want us to do, or maybe as well as we probably could, but we're content. You know what I mean? All our executives and our and our flipping partners and stuff get paid on time. Everyone's getting their bonuses. Stores are still open. We're not letting go of our retail staff. You know what I mean? They're they're decent. So I feel like when he pissed them off, they're like, you know what? Let's get him the fuck out of here. He thinks he owns this place. He thinks he runs this place. No, 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 no. We were here before Kanye will be here after him. And that's where I feel like they cut that quickly. Like they got the stuff out of the shop floors fast, all the advertising gone, done, done, did he? And they just shipped all the shit off to China and it all ended up on flipping Taobao, I think, as well for a while. Then that got taken down and, you know, now I don't know where that stuff has ended up. Um, Aidas could still move forward with a plan to sell the merchandise at discount without the label said Nikik, um, transforming them into something of zombie Yeezys. <laughs> hilarious but that's quite frankly a, a risky p p proposition says Nikki. not really man I think they underestimate sneakerheads honestly you put that stuff out there like I said you put a whole you put together a release calendar of Yeezys or maybe you don't tell people you just tell people the first week um, you, t you give them seven days or five days ahead of time um, heads up you drop them you give them 24 hours or a weekend to, to pay and to put their orders in. Whatever sells out, sells out. But then your know, next Monday, you start with a new fresh batch of shoes. You do that every other week. I guarantee you, you'll sell a lot of those units, a lot. Another option is liquidating the remaining merchandises through discount stores like TJ Maxx or selling it by a pound um, to a go-between who could then distribute it to retailers in developing countries, said Mark Cohen, a Columbia University Di Director of Retail Studies. That's going to be crazy. Something so valuable end up at TJ Maxx's. Like, not the odd pair, like, absolute, like, not even the odd shitty pairs like I just see here, but actual legit pairs. Like, not the Quantums and shit, or the, was that thing, the free 80s or whatever they called, the basket ones. Actual good ones end up there. It's going to be riled. Um, Experts said the liquidation is a normal part of the retail business. For example, All Birds, a shoe company, announced in August that it would be liquidating nearly $12 million um, dollars in clothing after unsuccessful pushing active wear leggings. Imagine buying all wear leggings, man. Whoever, whoever, whoever did that deal or whoever pushed that forward as an initiative, they probably got fired, I'm assuming. You can't be pushing All Birds, who make already terrible shoes, to then get into fucking active wear and then it flops. You can't keep your jobs, surely. You'd imagine so. Anyway, it continues. The company did not respond to the questions about how the products were, dis were dispersed. Cohen is convinced the Yeezys will eventually find their way to consumers. Almost everything you can imagine that is manufactured in the world is sold somewhere, somehow at some price, and those high-value Kanye West sneakers are going to wind up on people's feet. Maybe people who value the Kanye Association or people who don't care, they just want fresh, clean, modern footwear. Another option is to destroy the shoes and pr pr practice the some that some experts say is common in the industry despite unethical um, environmental concerns. Nike cut shoes in 
decided not to sell at the store in New York Soho. Other fashion brands such as Coach, Victoria's Secret, and Louis Vuitton have seen negative concern in recent for destroying their merchandise in an effort to preserve the value of the brand. Yeah, they don't throw them in the bin, they burn them. Burberry used to do that thing a lot. In 2018, Cynthia Burberry said it ended the practice of burning sort of merchandises that it once destroyed some 37 million worth. Imagine hating people, imagine hating poor people so much that you're willing to burn 37 million dollars instead of just giving it away. But I said it would be the worst outcome and one that makes of literal financial sense and comes with its own public relations pitfalls. Elizabeth Napier, an assistant professor at the University of Toledo, who has studied how fashion companies dispose of unsold products, said the best option of this would be to donate the shoes to a disaster relief. <laughs> Yo, university lecturers have no idea what to talk about. Assistant professor Elizabeth Napier, you need to go and take a nap yourself, my dear. That is an incredibly bad idea. Donate them to where? They're still going to resell them. Do you think people that work in flipping charities and places want to be dealing with unsold pairs of Yeezys? They'd resell them and then give them, and put that money into the charity they're working for. Or there's probably resellers that work there also. This is crazy. I don't know why they don't just come up with right, right now and do that. Because it's a bad idea, Napier. Um, the issue speaks to the inherent risk of the celebrity deals, Cohen said, which rely on the consistencies of the star's talent and popularity. These sometimes um, personally take a left or right turn, which leaves their counterparty in a blind side and the behaviour they're exhibiting doesn't align with the host's company values and his guess is endlessly tricky. Yeah, this is probably why that Travis Scott... Unfortunately, that Astro World tragedy is probably going to hurt Travis Scott more than anything his career has ever, you know, he's ever gone through his career because Travis was always seen as like a cookie cutter, brand friendly guy. But when that Travis, the Astro World travesty happened and he's, subsequently how he acted about it and just his lack of maybe concern and empathy about the whole thing and just his need to kind of get back on stage and put albums out and all that malarkey and then obviously the, you know, finding out how badly organized that festival was, it's going to make other brands aligning themselves with him really difficult because immediately people are going to always mention in the copy what happened at Astro World, or you know it's going to be tainted with that a little bit and maybe the sentiment around him has kind of changed so that's the issue but I feel like if you're collaborating with Kanye somebody of that level and that notoriety I just feel like you're going into it knowing the risk and you should be willing to accept it and just kind of weather the storm and just keep your head down and it'll go away because it did go away it took a long while time I know he went Alex Jones and he was saying loads of madness but eventually he got quiet again right he, even he got bored of himself and I feel like if you're a business and you're in the business of selling things you can't be picking and choosing who you sell things of based on their political or societal leanings you just have to kind of go with it unfortunately unless you do one of those kind of brands that says nah I don't work with people who don't agree with the things I agree with but I think overall it's a bit of a bad way to go about things personally for me Nike which ended up um, re-signing Vic in 2011 saying the whole athlete acknowledged saying the athlete at the time acknowledged his past mistakes so they're going to buck dance nice in dogfight and recently faced another dilemma in October after Kyrie Irving tweeted a photo and linked to her and refused to do a disavowed anti-Semitic film the Oregon based sneaker giant eventually cut ties to NBA star and said they would not release a Kyrie Irving the Kyrie sorry eights which is hilarious considering who else they've got signed at the moment in the statement to the post Nike said it was prioritizing donating recycling Kyrie eight products although it did not say how Nike has programmed to transform clothes um no transform what is considered unsellable inventory into materials for things like chin floors and even other shoes it's unclear whether Adidas has considered that option but Adidas said it would be losing uh one Adidas uh only gained some goodwill by donating a few basketball courts no matter what that does power says they're losing all the way around there are no winners of this one so the only winner will be yay of course because if he does work out some deal even if it's just a deal just kind of just like i don't know even if it's just a deal with like to just give him money or to kind of just end whatever court cases may be still ongoing he's still going to view us as a victory, right? Because they said he was cancelled. They said, you know, because he just wanted to prove the fact that there's nothing he can or cannot say. You know what I mean? He can say whatever he wants to say. And he said it. And life hasn't really changed that much for him, really. Do you know what I mean? Whoever he's... He didn't really probably... He probably knew who his real friends were ever since he kind of said he loved Trump and Trump was his dad. So him losing celebrity friends wasn't a big deal. He probably lost them back then. So you know that life is pretty much done he seems to have a pretty small circle he just tries around with his wife really assistants that's it really for the most part maybe design studio people he kind of keeps his counsel so if there is a winner it's definitely yay and of course his fans are going to be gloating as hell if this ends up going through as well but yeah weird thing 
no one's really confirmed or denied it which again i think speaks to the fact that it's maybe in the works and it's up in the air i think this goes to speak to it because no one really come out by either side and really said we haven't got a deal it's not happening they've kind of just let the news kind of play out but no one's obviously standing by it either most people kind of reporting that thing are mostly kind of you know blogs and like um hip-hop type platforms are reporting that they've got a deal in place but you know it's like anywhere reputable saying that that deal is happening but the fact that no one's coming out and denying it also shows to me that clearly there's some sort of you know um appetite for it because they want to make a deal because you know no one wants to write off half a billion if you don't have to so that makes a lot of sense but i just don't see the sense in getting him on board uh just to sell some shoes even though you don't really want him on board and then what's he meant to do like how's he meant to rah rah people to get them i don't know it's just a bit of a strange one that they're kind of going with but again what do i know next question i want to mention this just to kind of give a quick little um, shout out to my guy, uh, Matthew Williams at Givenchy. I thought this new collection that he put together for fall 2023 was maybe one of his best visually. I had a quick scan of it before I was starting the show and I immediately liked what I see. And I think if anything, this kind of reminds you, this kind of solidifies my point I mentioned before. I think I was speaking about the Heron Preston show at New York Fashion Week. He went back to New York Fashion Week, which was amazing because, you know, Heron Preston, I feel like, you know, his roots and what he's kind of known for are intrinsically tied to New York. So it's good to see him go there instead of kind of going, well, the popular kids going to Paris. Paris, even though it's probably got more exposure and whatnot there i think that the new york collection is really amazing but one thing i didn't like about that collection that he presented in new york fashion week was that it was too and again this is coming from an avid streetwear guy right i'm the streetwear guy i love streetwear that's been my thing for ages i'll take streetwear over fashion any day of the week and it's something that i kind of hold dear to my heart and i get annoyed when i see these streetwear guys who eventually make it to the runaways d disavowing streetwear and saying oh streetwear wasn't really the thing i wanted to do i wanted to do fashion and it kind of poo poo it but i feel like streetwear is to me one of the best avenues for people who actually want to make clothes to kind of get into making clothes because it allows you to kind of go in all sorts of different directions but i also respect what fashion is the capital f and i feel like runways especially fashion weeks in general should be a place to sort of like wonder lust and kind of exhibit and create and go a bit crazy or maybe just kind of you know offer something different than what you maybe do with your regular stuff and i feel like Heron Preston should probably adopt what Matthew Williams of Givenchy and especially what he's doing now with his kind of quote unquote women's wear line and just kind of offer something a little bit more interesting a little bit more fashion-esque a little bit more subtle a little bit more sleek um, than what his usual offerings are like that you kind of know are known for and I feel like that's be the best way to kind of showcase your broad range of skills and what you can kind of offer your clientele and just to kind of set the levels a little bit because I feel like the hair and stuff is getting a little bit repetitive getting a little bit boring and I don't really think it's got that's that's its place the stuff that he presents should be in a runway like I look at hair and press maybe similar to like Acne Studios Acne Studios what they present on the runway isn't what you get on the online store it's like two different things but it's kind of the same label so I feel like maybe you should present that kind of streetwear stuff in a lookbook but then on the runway it's like quote unquote what you'd imagine fashion to be like there's something to, there's some looks of it that I like that hair impression but I feel like not in general and I feel like this collection from, from Matthew Williams and Givenchy is a good example of how to do this because I'm sure in store if you still want a hoodie if you still want a studded cap if you still want some core cool boots you could get it but on the runway he's got some great overcoats um there's some great dresses there some great dresser blazers um i love this the, the flipping mesh on the other side the length of the sleeves is absolutely impeccable on some of these looks here the great styling again i don't know who's styling Givenchy nowadays or working with matthew williams but i feel like they're doing a really good job i think even the, the couple previous men's we chose were styled impeccably even some of the items were that great i think the styling kind of helped to spruce them up really well here you got some really great mini skirt type-esque looking looks here going on you got some great use of color like this look here number 11 i'm not sure if that's kai gerber and i don't know if that is her i don't think that is but no look number 11 of this show this fall 2023 look from Givenchy by president matthew williams is great like i don't think you'd be able to know if no one if you didn't know what brand it was i don't think you could tell if this was Givenchy. maybe any of these looks maybe you would tell this but i don't think able to tell number 11 this is really nice very 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 well done for matthew williams and again I've I've been a long fan I've been a long time fan of this because I feel like from the entire group of people who made it from that kind of you know school of Virgil school of Kanye I feel like he's the one who I feel like had the most to prove because he wasn't he didn't necessarily maybe he was driving force behind Bin Trill and shit obviously he did some stuff with Lady Gaga when they were together in terms of costume design but I never really thought like he presented that or maybe gave us an inkling that he had it that he was that guy but then as soon as a leak drops you're like raw 
this is really good, isn't it? Off the bat, like he came out of the gate strong. But then when he got into Givenchy, I also felt like maybe the Elite's thing, the maybe heavy reliance on what you'd call streetwear or modern wear, whatever casual wear, it maybe would seep through and it'd be a bit too casual. And of course, considering what Givenchy were like and where they needed resuscitation, I feel like he's done a really good job, even though some of the you know fashion Twitter people aren't necessarily the biggest fans of his. I feel like he does get some unnecessary stick because I feel like the stuff is really strong. Um, I love everything about it. Good shapes, good dresses, good cuts good accessories the, sh the shoes are really nice um this angular aggressive almost like pin arrow type design on the boots is really good the sleeve this uh, the length of the sleeves of some of these looks is really 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 nice great styling great layering there's a look here number 24 there's like maybe three or four layers on it's even the same with look 23 you got the overcoat you got some sort of bag maybe they're wearing here at the back you got a jacket or shirt with a with a kind of rumpled collar maybe it's a catsuit all together you got these great shoes like this is, oh, look at look number 27 that's hard as hell that's something you'd expect to see from Matthew Williams you've got this great layering you've got this kind of like an amazing texture thing he does on his jeans kind of reminds you of what you know John Takashi did with these undercover scab pants and shit um, you've got some great little hardware details here on the side hanging off you know coats with hoodies and shit this is a quintessential like basically Matthew Williams look this might be his muse essentially but then the rest is really different you know what I mean I love everything about this. Really, really nicely done. There's like a re-engineered, what's that look like? A baseball jacket of some sort here. Same here. This kind of reminds me, a little weird to say, but this sort of reminds me of like a Sean John look, number 30. There's like a collection, maybe one of his collections they did on the runway. There's like a look like this, I think, off of Sean John. And I'm just thinking, maybe also, maybe it's Tom Ford. I'm not really sure. Imagine me, imagine me confusing Sean John and Tom Ford. And then, so it starts off very, very... Um, surprising like you wouldn't expect from Matthew Williams and it kind of ends in stuff that you would expect Matthew Williams to be making in terms of these kind of com cargo -y type pants that he has going on here with the hardware bits hanging off of them I think they look like bondage pants a little bit or parachute or sorry like an ode to maybe Vivian Westwood um, and that sort of nod to her but they look really well done look at these glasses and these bits of jewellery the use of green and again it's a different sort of hue from the Bottega green it's sort of like a little bit more washed out um, I love that a little bit more dyed out the colour palette it's like look at these shapes man this is really good Matthew Williams is getting better and better and again this is the key to it because he's got the youth in his hands he's got the cultural zeitgeist there his fingers on the pulse he's in the mix he's young give the guy time and he'll eventually put together a good collection a good together a good concise collection and show growth and look at this no theatrics no craziness on the runway just a well lit cube and loads of amazing pieces walking down a catwalk this over wow let me look there are 50 60 jesus christ so many good collections here so many good looks here overall and of course you see my feelings at the end there with his kind of signature um buy thing that he does now with the two flipping with the peace sign there i feel it's great overall i'm, I'm a fan of it all um i love it quickly read over the review see what he's saying it says that Givenchy is given one of the big five in the canon of French of fashion sorry French fashion but unlike Chanel's societally trailblazing menswear appropriation Dior's epoch shift okay too many blabbering here until January's menswear show Matthew M. Williams efforts to mesh his design identity with that of the opaque house profile were mostly thwarted first by the COVID house um sorry Firstly, by the COVID's cause and possibility of connecting with the audience of his collection, then by over elaborate collections that were too bombastically presented and thereby enraged. Now, however, he seems to have struck upon an effective recipe through which appetizingly blend himself with the house that Hubert built. Today's show again took place in the Ecole Militaire, um, pleasingly closed and focused in Givenchy's white box. It repeated elements of January's menswear formula while adding fresh women's wear specific elements, again, with the um, open with the baseline of wasted coat tailoring. Well, it's a black coat terrier, sorry, um, which some looks of one to five was crafted in the couture atelier. Okay, that's interesting. So some of this was done by the couture. Okay. Um, defining elements were generous box pleats and back and two inward facing button down pleats running down each side of the jacket or coats. These are totally created different faded and favors and then came two leather bouncer jackets, one black, one purple, that the paradigm pieces of his Williams 2.0 face of Chivon Shi. Let's see what other things he says. Quotes. So you got quotes from him. Do you speak at the back here? What did he say? Um, 
blah, blah, blah. Let's see what he actually said himself. A printed fabric overlaid mesh dress with a gated, um, with a gathered neckline was Williams conceded possibly an inadvertent echo of Gianni Versace's design language. All respected the greats for sure. Um, some more did the prince. Okay, he said that. What else you say? Not many comment, comments from him directly. He says here, sitting front row alongside Jared Leto, now several stops into his post Gucci tour was Karen Reitfeld, who has been consulting with Williams and Givenchy on women's wear. No wonder it was so good then, huh? That little bit of panache, a little bit of refinement. If anything, even her hair and makeup was very Kareem Wrightfield, isn't it? Interesting. It says, said Williams of Interaction, um, we have a dialogue about making desirable clothes. I'm so inspired by women around me. And, you know, spending so much time with Kareen, she understands the house so well. We literally just talk about clothes. With Royfield, Williams is shaping a Givenchy women's identity that contains multi-generational, continent-striding multitudes. I love this, man. That's a great marriage, isn't it? Maybe he needed that. That's what he needed. Just that muse, that sounding board, that bit of insight, that little bit of chic. Because that's one thing about Karen Ruffo. She's a very chic woman, right? Very good looking, very well put together. An older lady that's kind of got a finger on a pulse. And somebody that's old, but also got a young heart as well. Um, loads of experience and whatnot. Like that would be a great person to kind of marry up with. So whoever did that and pulled her in, in general, did a great job. That's a really, really good idea. But yeah, enjoyed everything about it. Um, Givenchy Four, twenty twenty three, ready to wear. Check it out if you haven't already before. Definitely, definitely one of my favorites so far that I've seen. Big up Matthew M. Williams for proving the doubt was wrong, and also being one of my favorites. So. That is it for me, actually, of the Action Zing Show episode number 650. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a great one, as per usual. I'll be back again very, very soon, very, very sharpest. So if you have enjoyed this show and you do like it, you know what to do, share it and all that good stuff. I'll be greatly appreciated. Of course, links regarding myself can be found in the description. You'll hear a nice tune of the day if you listen to this video audio track. But if you are watching this via YouTube, you won't. Unfortunately, it'll just fade to black. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Take care, be safe, and... Peace, my friends.